Welcome to the Samuel Andreev podcast. My guest today is the Ukrainian pianist Dina Pisarenko. Dina Pisarenko is certainly one of the most remarkable musicians that I have had the honor of working with, and we're going to talk today about music in Ukraine. First, I'm going to read Dina's biography, and then we're going to get into a discussion about her teachers, what she learned from them, what the situation is like for musicians in Ukraine, and many other topics. Dina Pisarenko was born in Donetsk, Ukraine. She's a pianist and an accompanist at the National Tchaikovsky Music Academy of Ukraine, soloist of the Ucho Ensemble Kiev, and a laureate of the Levko Rivatsky Award in 2014, as well as the 6th International Prokofiev Competition in St. Petersburg in 2013. While still studying at the Donetsk Specialized Music School for Gifted Children, Dina was twice a laureate of the International Competition in Memory of Vladimir Horovitz in Kiev. She graduated with honors from the Prokofiev Donetsk State Music Academy in 2009, where she studied with Professor Lydia Adamenko. Eager to embrace various styles in her repertoire, Dina devotes particular attention to contemporary music. Since 2006, she has premiered a number of pieces by living composers, performing at important Ukrainian festivals such as Kiev Music Fest, Gogol Fest, Donbass Modern Music Academy, etc. Together with Ucho Ensemble Kiev, under the baton of Luigi Gajero, she has given the Ukrainian premieres of several important pieces of the 20th and 21st centuries, including A Propos du Concert de la Semaine Dernière by myself, Quasi Una Fantasia by Georgi Kotag, Kama Concert by Klaus Stefan Mankov, and the Piano Concerto of Georgi Ligeti. Dina participated in a conducting masterclass held by Maestro Luigi Gajero with the Ucho Ensemble Kiev, making her debut as a conductor with Integral by Edgar Varese in 2016 and Epicycle by Yanis Zanakis in 2018. Since 2009, Dina Pisarenko has accompanied the class of Professor Valery Ivko, one of the founders of the Ukrainian Domra School. In the 2013 to 2014 season, she was accompanist at the Anatoly Solevyenenko Donetsk Opera and Ballet Theatre. She has also participated as a repetiteur in three operas staged at the National Opera of Ukraine, produced by Ucho Agency and conducted by Luigi Gajero. Limbus Limbo by Stefano Gervasoni, Pane Sali Sabia by Carmine Emanuele Chada, and Luci Mie Traditrici by Salvatore Charino in 2018. Thank you very much, Dina, for agreeing to appear on the podcast. It's very good to see you. Thank you for inviting me, and uh, I'm glad to see and to hear you too. So we're going to talk today about music in Ukraine. Now, that's a topic that I'm particularly interested in for a number of reasons. I've been to Kiev twice. I've had the immense honor of recording a CD with you uh, entitled Irides Iridescent Notation on which you appeared as piano soloist on several of the pieces. And we've had the occasion to work together on, uh, on well, several times. And Kiev is a city that is very close to my heart, certainly, and in which, for me as a composer, I've been able to have working conditions that are unlike any that I've ever had. It is, of course, with a great deal of sadness that, uh, that I witnessed the events that are unfolding in Ukraine today. Did you ever expect that something like this would happen? No. <laughs> I've never expected this. No one expected. No one of, from musicians. Uh, it, was a, it was a terrible shock to the system. Of course, in, in February, there, was, there were concerns that something might happen, but yeah. nobody was, of course, sure what would end up happening. Speaking about the, the current situation, which is a war, so yes uh, from one side no one expected from the other side yes we expected seeing the news see, knowing the situation but i mean one thing is to read the news and the other thing is your inner knowledge and something inside you so you never expect the worst to happen and the war is there not since Seb since February, but since 2014, when Russia occupied my hometown, actually, Donetsk, and another city in the east of Ukraine, Lugansk, and Crimea as well. So it is, this has started long before. Yeah, and this is, of course, 
not a not a new situation, although it's a it's it's a dramatic escalation, and it's one that none of us were expecting. Um, we should mention that uh, I was, in fact, intending to go to Kiev in March for a project with the Kiev Symphony Orchestra, in which you would have appeared, and. Instead of uh, of meeting over there and working on this beautiful project that we spent years putting together, uh, together with Luigi, uh, instead, it's uh, it's cancelled, and we have no idea, of course, when it's going to be possible to do it again. So that is, of course, a, a very sad thing. Um, what I'd like to do, Dina, is to talk a little bit about your uh, your your training as a musician and your early years learning to. Uh, learning to be a performer in Ukraine and what what that was like. And I think that's something that, for people who don't have direct experience with Ukraine, it's it's difficult to understand what the musical life is like there. It's quite different than uh, the way musical life is organized in Western European countries. Maybe we could start there. Could you tell us a little bit about how you began your training? Thank you for this question. And yes, I began my training quite soon because I was born in a musical family, so I started to play piano quite soon and uh, appeared on stage also quite soon, won competitions for children and so on. And uh, yes, so that was my my life since always. I wanted today to, I'm grateful really to you for this occasion to speak, and I would like to speak about my teacher, Valery Yufko, whom I met uh, already being quite um, quite adult, but uh, the person who, who really changed my life and uh, each and every of us, his students, uh, Valery Yufko, Valery Nikitich. Um, first, I heard his orchestra, back in i think 2008 or 2009 and before before our zoom meeting i was just re listening to the recordings to because because i love them valeri nikitic passed away 10 days ago and it's um, for us enormous loss and uh, pain it is inside us the love and uh, the knowledge that he gave us and the passion so the impressions from the concerts, from the first concerts that I heard, it was the words that I can choose best are the miracle and the spell of a time which, you know, which of a very special space and time which uh, is above everyday life. They were playing Vivaldi and Mozart. And uh, the orchestra is called the Likdom, which is translated into English like uh, Face of Domra. And Domra is a Ukrainian instrument, also speaking about Ukrainian music, uh, which um, its history goes back to 12th century, to the epoch of Kievan Rus. Then there was a period, like a gap in its history, uh, because it was um, prohibited and also physically destroyed by Russian Empire because it was uh, the instrument used by, you know, street musicians and uh, these artists who might um, contribute to social criticism and this thing, so it was destroyed. And then it was reconstructed in 20th century, and I, I will send you the link to read about the instrument. So this was the orchestra. This is the orchestra made up totally of his students, and students of his students. Uh, you know, the, these concerts were expected by everyone, like uh, really a fresh air and 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 the magic i can't uh, choose a better uh, word than a magic because listening to this music you you understood that it is true and that there is something higher so that 
there is a higher sense being tr transmitted. And for us, our teacher was the was and is and will always be the incarnation of values and of qualities that every human being and every musician might aspire for, might want to be. So really the truth, the devotion, 100, 200, 2000 percent devotion to the music, honor and honesty. So I have heard his orchestra. I was totally in love with what they do and how they do. And also with um, all, all the people, all the musicians who were playing because they were so beautiful, you know. So with um, um, something which is in the eyes, you know, something light, something love for the music and a true love to what you do. I, I don't know if I explain myself in English. So absolutely well <clears throat> something uh, that that you that you feel and uh, perceive really so um then i asked him if i might become a pianist of his class and shortly afterwards i was taken he took me Valerian Kitich took me to his class so i worked basically until this december for more than 10 years so one part of activity was this orchestra uh with which i also had several occasions to play they played a repertoire from really from vivaldi to lutoslavsky and to modern ukrainian music so enormous repertoire valeri nikitich held the lectures it was every friday at two o'clock lectures which i don't know how do you say in english like music interpretation or the uh, methodic uh, of teaching music everyone was coming even with their own chairs to these lectures, not only their, his students, but also um, violinists, double bass players, whatever, singers, pianists like me, composers. Everyone was there to hear these lectures because they were not only about music, but they were basically about the place of music in life and about what it is. It was given to, to us the meaning of what we do might seem obvious, but it is not obvious that what you do makes sense and what you do is good, is true and is high. So after these lectures, we went away with the feeling that, yeah, that there is a sense and there is a meaning. The center of his school was uh, centered uh, around time, musical time, but he encircled this theory in uh, mm, speaking about really also physics about philosophy quoting uh, plato and uh, santo agostino and einstein and uh, hubble telescope so whatever so he really gave us the global picture but there, there was more about it because it was not only the real knowledge that was transmitted but also the way how it was transmitted to us i'm glad you mentioned all of that because w what i get from your description is that this teaching went far beyond matters of technique. In fact, yeah. you, you didn't even mention the word technique. Uh, no. What you no, what you talked about was the was the the meaning, the meaning yeah. of of the music, and the spiritual depth of it also, and the ideas that might connect with it, and the humanity of it, yeah. and. To emphasize that as a teacher, I think, is a very rare and special thing. Because it's easier, quite frankly, to talk about technique, isn't it? I mean, you know, technique is something that you can develop a method for, and you can describe it in, you know, objective terms. But the things that you're describing can't be described in objective terms. So that sounds like a tremendous gift to have had a teacher like that. Yes. So... The second uh, trait was so first that I wanted to speak about was the orchestra and the second these lectures and then also the lessons with with the students and then so going on speaking about meaning yes indeed he, then he was speaking about okay, ne no really never about technique but pointing an ideal to strive for and demanding from a student to do their best and never giving up, never surrendering without achieving a 
what he wanted from from a student and what he wanted from the music of how he wanted to hear the music but there is a difference because there can be different i understood that much later there can be difference in uh, why you do this or that and what i understood later that he's been demanding was actually a manifestation of um, deepest respect to a student and of um to a person as a human being because the motivation of it was the belief and also he was saying that always the belief of whatever is there of divine in a human being so also he repeated to us often that we are using our brain not on 100 percent you know so he really wanted us to to pull out whatever there is of divine in a human being so so this was the ultimate sense of what we were doing actually that reminds me actually of of a, of a quote from igor stravinsky who was asked in one of the conversation books with robert Kraft what his personal definition of the word technique was mm -hmm. and stravinsky's response i think was was fantastic he said technique is the whole person it's everything it's 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 what you are as a as a person everything you are as a person goes into your technique it's it's not a matter of it's certainly not a matter of scales and arpeggios and so on and learning how to write chorales and, and correct counterpoint and all of that it's it's the it's the complete human being in the with all of your forces brought together in service of in, in service of the musical idea yeah yes so the lesson with with valeri nikitic was um really a, something which breathes life into the piece of music and which really made you understand that music is highest form of human activity but i mean it it's not mere words but you 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 could feel it by every word, by every gesture, by by in his eyes. So, so that's it. Yes, I think that's an extremely noble thing to pursue. Absolutely, it, it's hard to think of some, a higher thing that you could do with your life, actually, than to engage in a pursuit like that. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so you so you studied then for ten years. Actually, no, I, I've been an accompanist in his class of Domura. I see. Yeah, because in Ukraine, uh, every instrument, a class of um, instrument, which is not piano, but uh, like violin, um, wind instruments, brass instruments, they always have an accompanist, always have a pianist, which is always there. So I understand. You mentioned that you worked together on a very broad range of repertoire, including, of course, classical music, but also Lutislavsky yeah. and, and contemporary Ukrainian composers. So I'm really curious to know, what was your first contact with 20th and 21st century music like? And how was it presented to you when you first started looking at these scores? I mean, was it presented as just something, as just something normal, or were they... Were you given uh, sort of a speech as to you know how to approach the music, how to understand it, or was it just you know here's here's a piece of music and you have to do something with it? You mean my studies as a pianist or in the class of uh, Valerievko? Your studies as a pianist. Pianist. No, actually no. We I studied in Donetsk and uh, basically. No, we played no contemporary music. Like the the most contemporary author was might be Prokofiev or Shostakovich or Hindemith sometimes. Mm -hmm. so, no, I started uh, playing contemporary music in 2013 because I felt the need. I felt that I cannot uh, consider myself a professional musician if I don't play contemporary music. So. I was actually curious and I was, uh, I merely knew that I have to do this. So why is that? Because pianists, of course, have a tremendous repertoire. Uh, it's, it's probably the largest repertoire of any instrument except possibly the violin. It's not like you have any lack of pieces to play. I mean, you could just play 18th and 19th century music and that would be enough. Mm 
So why why the need to play contemporary repertoire as well? Just because of what I what I just said, because we live in the twenty first century, so it's only fair to play the music of today. So to give the voice of to our contemporaries. Yeah. Well, I have to thank you for doing that because I've been among the beneficiaries of this. And one of the things that struck me when I first started working with you was the extraordinary intensity that you brought to bear upon your interpretations. Like there was a, a total, a feeling of total identification with what you might describe as the spiritual content of the music. And that goes far beyond the question of putting the right notes in the right place. And one thing that has often disturbed me about the way contemporary music is often performed is that we have the impression that as long as there aren't too many mistakes and the rhythms are correct, then the performer has done their job. A lot of the time, I'm exaggerating somewhat, because of course there are lots of wonderful, uh, yeah. gifted performers that don't approach things this way. But in, in a professional sense, though, very often there's a certain pressure to get into the rehearsal and work efficiently and deliver a correct performance of the piece. But it's actually quite rare, especially in an ensemble setting, not to mention an orchestral setting, that the performers would seek to go a lot farther than that. Thank you for saying so, first of all. Thank you for your music and it was for us always a I, I don't say pleasure to work because uh, the meaning of it is is not Mozart or Vivaldi, so it's it's sometimes uh, like more tragic and more dramatic. But so it's not doesn't fit into the concept of pleasure. But <laughs> <laughs> it might it might for some people. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> so, but it enriched us as musicians and as human beings the contact with, with your music. So, and uh, speaking about ensemble, yes, we, I think all of us are like this. All of us are united because I guess every musician of ensemble is a person who is seeking the meaning, who is like, searching for the sense of what, what we do, starting from our conductor, we do get better. So, so this, I, I think this is why it, it works because all of us search the meaning. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's absolutely what makes it so powerful and unique. And those are, of course, for a composer, uh, extraordinary experiences to have. So I have to say also, the, the times that I was in Kiev, I was really struck by the number of people that were attending the concerts. And attending the concerts with extraordinary enthusiasm also. I mean, there was a, a, an electric feeling of enthusiasm at all of those events that really struck me. That's something I, I, I just, I have to wonder why. I have to wonder why, because I spoke with some Ukrainian composition students, some young students on my last trip, and they told me that their professors were still from the Soviet era, uh, and those professors were not particularly interested in uh, 20th century music, and that really wasn't the focus of their training. That it was, it was more, what would you say? It was more focused on the techniques of the past, I suppose. So where does that enthusiasm come from? Where, because, you know, the last concert I had in Kiev, there were at least 400 people there, and just the most extraordinary interest in something that cannot have been, you know, a, a, a familiar experience for the people in the audience. So why do you think that is? You know, I'm not into the social studies, so uh, I can respond, respond only for myself, I guess, uh, because people need it. So I, I, can, I can speak for myself. I, I do, I study new music, I study contemporary, I study music of the past or, and of the present because yeah because i need it because it makes i don't know how to explain because it is a way to study also your history and to study your your past and your present present to understand where you are and who you are so 
it's the way of, of knowing the reality and maybe better than reading news or watching i don't know whatever well it's another type of reality isn't it the uh yeah. the the american poet ezra pound had a line about this he said literature is news that stays news and i think that's mm -hmm. a good definition of art in general music is yeah. <laughs> is, is news but it's news that stays new <laughs> it's not just what you read in the newspaper that day it's it's more enduring but there's something in a, in a great work of art there's a kind of enduring freshness that never dies that's something that i think is really remarkable you know when you when you play a great piece of music even if it's 400 years old that feeling of freshness re-emerges every time it's played if it's played with a real sense of engagement So I want to hear more then about your about your studies in Ukraine. Um, and I'm really interested also in how you managed to make the jump from being a student to being a, a professional and a very remarkable professional with a successful international career now. So maybe we could talk a little bit about that because your career has taken you uh, quite a lot outside of Ukraine. Was there a point at which you decided you would expand your professional aims in that sense or did it just happen sort of naturally thank you no i'm i don't think i have a successful international career now so i'm just i just do what i do and uh, no i lived and worked in my hometown until basically the war started so when it was not not possible anymore to work there i went away thanks to help of my friends also and thanks to help of my teacher Valerievko and all our class because we were united and we decided to go away together all of us together so so that was our decision that we have taken all of us to go there where it would be possible to continue to make music and uh, then the important page as, as you know as we know is the Wuhan Ensemble Kiev so this is something which for us I think for many of us musicians of the ensemble became a center of our attention and a center of the priority where you try to give the best of your quality best a lot of your time to really build up something which is which is yours which is what we do yeah so for for listeners who may not be familiar with that the uh dina is talking about the uho ensemble that's u-k-h-o and of course we'll put links in the in the podcast yeah. description for anybody who wants to see the videos but i can certainly say uh, having worked with the ensemble on several occasions and also having heard many of the interpretations and the and the cds that it is one of the finest ensembles of its kind in the world absolutely and there's uh, actually a series of Ucho ensemble CDs available on the Kairos label, including this one, Iridescent Notation, which features Dina as a soloist. And I mention that not out of any form of self-publicity, but really in order to, to make a case for the qualities of this remarkable ensemble, which uh, again is an absolute treasure. So of course, with the tragic events that are occurring at the moment, it's very difficult to say what the future looks like. But are you in touch with your colleagues from the Ujo Ensemble right now? 
And what, yeah. what, what do you think is going to happen? No one knows. But we are going to win. Ukraine is going to win and rebuild and be prosperous. And we are going to make music again. I'm in touch with many of the musicians from the ensemble, and of course, it's a it's a time of great concern for me as well. And uh, all I can say, of course, is that I hope this is over soon. I hope it's over soon, and that uh, and that we'll be able to do that. We'll be able to continue doing what we had started doing. So, what sort of repertoire are you working on? At the moment, what are the things that you are, are playing currently, and what are the things that you would like to play? And what what do you imagine yourself doing over the next few years, if you can look ahead that far, right now? Right, right now, as as I said, um, I'm in Genova, and uh, I work in opera theater. Yeah, and so currently we work on Manon Lesko by Puccini. So that's that's my life for the next months. Uh, until the end of March. And um, no, I don't build up the big plans now because I don't I don't feel like planning now. Yeah. I can imagine that this sort of situation would shorten your time horizon. You can't imagine six months or a year ahead. You're sort of focused on the day to day, maybe one week to the next. I, I started to play with uh, some musicians here, with my colleagues in the theater. So we we are searching. We would like to find occasions to play. Mm -hmm. So, but it's for now. It's only like drafts. It's only projects. It's only the ideas. You know, they didn't really take form yet. Yeah. Well, it's early. This hasn't been going on for very long, although it feels like an eternity. Um, okay, so so I'd also like to hear more about the way music is structured in Ukraine. Um, not only the institutions for learning, but also the way the orchestras and ensembles and so on are run. Because, of course, in Western Europe, you have a model of state sponsorship where ensembles and orchestras and all, the, all of the infrastructure for music for classical and contemporary music is to a greater or lesser extent supported by the state. So, and, and that includes, of course, the, the conservatories and, and to some extent the universities as well. How does that look in Ukraine? If you want to be a performer, do you study at a university, in a conservatory, an academy? What does that look like? And what sort of, what does the training look like? Is it academic training? Is it, is it practical training? Yeah, it's a conservatory, musical school. Then in the most city, in big Ukrainian cities, there is a um, 10 years school, a phenomenon which uh, combines a school and a college. So an um, institution where you study for 10 years. And then afterwards you go directly to the music academy. Then there are a postgraduate studies also, PhD. Okay, and then what? <laughs> what happens when you graduate? How, how does the how does the situation look for a, a young Ukrainian musician beginning their career? Because certainly in Britain or France or Germany, there's a certain amount of anxiety for a lot of young people when they begin their careers. You never know what's going to happen, if you're going to be able to find a position somewhere or be able to find work. How does that look for a Ukrainian musician? It looks tough. Yeah, not everyone finds a job by profession, by the profession that one studied. So it's a problem. Well, I suppose in that sense, it's like anywhere. But I think there is one difference, though, maybe. And you can tell me what you think about this. But when I was in Kiev, I was struck by the fact that the music world seemed to be less regimented than it is in Europe, which is to say that if there was a rehearsal from two to five, for example, you don't necessarily start at two and stop at five. <laughs> if you need to take some more time to work on the piece, then that can happen. And that doesn't really happen very much in Western Europe, I have to say, because things are very, very rigid, uh, very, very rigidly planned. 
And if you're mm -hmm. stopping at five, you really stop at five. It doesn't matter what sort of shape the piece is in. But it seemed to me in Kiev that if you needed to stay an extra hour or two or three, then the musicians invariably were eager to stay for as long as they needed to in order to get the piece sounding the way they wanted it. Yeah, yes, that's true. <laughs> because, so we, we come back to the beginning of our talk because what we do, I, I take the liberty to respond for all of us, but I, I think that everyone will agree. So I permit myself that we are working for the result. So we are working to, for the meaning once again of what we do. So it's not about ours. I mean, it's again, it's, in a final account, this stopping at five works against you because then you will have this CD for the rest of your life. So you, you want it to be, <laughs> to be as good as you, as you can do. So this is something what you do where you put your, your soul, your signature, your name, or your everything. So yeah. This is how I feel about it too. It's sometimes hard to convince other people that that's something worth pursuing. <laughs> but <laughs> well, if I if I'm working on something and and you, you know there's a sense that you want to you want it to be everything that it possibly can be. And if that means that you have to stay up all night or if that means that you have to work a few more days, then you do that because the work of art has the potential to be I don't know if permanent is the right word, but as permanent as anything that we may have access to as humans, it has that potential. It doesn't mean that all artworks will survive indefinitely, of course, and many of them will be forgotten or destroyed, but the potential is there for that to happen. And that changes the way you approach the work. At least it does for me. So is there anything that you'd like to say to viewers who might be watching this in North America or Western Europe about the situation that is unfolding in Ukraine, something that they might not know, that might not be on the news from somebody who, of course, is from there. I would like to say thank you to everyone who will listen to us. And also I would like to invite our listeners to listen to Ukrainian music and uh, to listen to Lik Domer, and I will, maybe, I will send you the links, or maybe we'll write in the comments. So I, I will send you the, these files. So for those who know Ukrainian music already, I would like to invite to listen to it again, and for those who maybe never heard before uh, to discover. like to mention the vocal tradition because so in Ukrainian music for me there, there are two fields uh, so the most important which um, describe best so it's the folk music and the vocal music so vocal also because the Ukrainian language is melodic because of it's cantabile let's let's say so so it gives the really possibilities of, of being sung so yes
listen to liturgy by Lesa Dechko, listen to folk songs, listen to choirs by Hanna Gavrilets, a Ukrainian composer who also passed away shortly after the war has begun. Yes. Yes, we'll inc we'll include links for for these composers and and performers in the in the video, so anybody who wants to hear these things can, of course. And I'd like to mention also the contemporary Ukrainian composer Maxim Kolomiets, who uh, I had hoped also to speak with on the podcast, but he is in Kiev right now, and his circumstances, as you can imagine, are quite difficult. So we weren't able to um, uh, to arrange to do an interview, but in my opinion, he's one of the finest composers in Ukraine right now, certainly in the in the younger generation, and I think his music should be much more widely known. So I'll also put a link in there for some of yeah. Maxim's music. Are there any other one, contemporary Ukrainian composers that you might like to mention? Yes, I'd like to mention uh, Oleksiy Voitenko, who is. Uh, composer and researcher and an incredible noble person and now he is arranging um, a catalog of ukrainian music with a team of uh, yeah with a team but i mean he's the brain of that team so he dedicates a lot of time really to systematize and to put in order our heritage i would mention my favorite piece of his, which is the music of Eric Zahn, and it is on YouTube. Also, for people who may not know the musical heritage of Ukraine very well, um, what about 19th and early 20th century composers who are who are some figures that that we might like to discover for those who don't already know speaking about 20th century it's it's difficult because so from the 60s there is a, a quality shift in ukrainian music because when stalin died so there was a sort of uh, of um, spring of revival of new possibilities that opened up. Of, um, this, it's a famous generation of the sixties: Leonid Hrabovsky, Vitaly Hodzatsky, Valentin Silvestro, which would be, I think, the most famous name that is known in Europe. Also, uh, so this is the generation of the sixties, and in the beginning of uh, the twentieth century, it was mostly tragic because most of our ukrainian composers were persecuted and physically eliminated by the soviets so the example that maybe everyone knows is mikola leontovich the famous author of, um, of a song which in europe and in america is known as carol of the bells how did things change after 1991 in ukraine for music oh <laughs> they changed for good I can't compare in because I was born in 80, 88, so I was three three years old. But um, I might imagine what was before and that before it was not like this, by far not like this. And after 91, we have a blossoming of festivals, of ensembles, of initiatives, of composers, of performers, of whatever. So every big city in Ukraine, uh, the festival of contemporary music, but also classical music, it was blossoming, really. And also ensembles, I might mention just a few of them, like uh, Ricochet, Nova Musica of Ukraine. So Ensemble Nostri Temporis, where Maxim played for many years. And then starting from 2015, our Ensemble Kiev, I mean, it, it did not come on a soil where nothing was before. So these processes, yes, indeed, they started in 1991, the process of raising, of waking up. Mm -hmm. Right, so you're from a generation that didn't know the Soviet period directly. Yes, yes, I, I didn't know it directly, but I, I can imagine. Well, this, this work that has been done and the ground that has been laid for things like the Uho Ensemble, of course, I think, uh, is very, very strong. And if one can be optimistic in such a terrible time, 
then my feeling is that the ensemble will not be broken, and this is going to continue. Thank you, Dina, for taking the time to talk with me today. Um, Thank you. I'm going to again. There's going to be a whole series of links in the in the video if you'd like to hear Dina's performances with the Uho Ensemble uh, or some of the composers she mentioned. All of that is going to be there, and I'm also going to include in the video a link or several links to ways that you can help uh, Ukraine right now. For anybody that feels that this is a situation that cannot be allowed to continue, there are ways to help. And I would certainly urge anybody who's watching this video to do so. And all I can say is I I hope from the bottom of my heart that this stops very, very soon. Thank you so much. Thank you.